So we're going to start with a real quick interlude. I know that most of you are here because we want to talk about operational security because that's what was on the piece of paper. Everybody looked and said, oh, operational security, awesome. However, WannaCry, uh, anybody hear about that? Yeah, a few people. <laughs> a couple of people familiar with like NHS, uh, the healthcare service overseas right now in Britain, getting super tore up by this thing. Uh, Microsoft getting real crazy with releasing some patches for all the way back to Windows XP days. That's big deal, real big deal right now. And if you are in the community in terms of uh, sitting around talking to people who are actually dealing with some of this stuff, this is a very, very big deal. Let's go over some of the numbers. At least 300,000 machines compromised, minimum, right now. Okay. It only took a few hours for developers to look at this code after it was released into the wild and immediately start making uh, variants. So they took what was released, saw it, saw how effective it was, and said, hey, this is an awesome thing. We can use this to make it even worse. And they immediately started improving the code. Uh, if you are curious, uh, you can actually go to the link that's on my page. And it will take you, I archive pretty much everything. Uh, so if you notice that it sends you to archive.is, this is just an archival web page so that anything that we discuss here, it doesn't get lost to the sands of time, that's all. So don't think that this is strange. It just so happens I'm just using this for this. This is the actual Microsoft Security Bulletin that discuss, discusses WannaCry. So if you want a sort of a breakdown of what Microsoft is saying, you can go here and see this, okay? In addition to that, there is already a GitHub set up with individuals going in there and deconstructing the code themselves. So you can actually follow along and see as they work on this and see how it was developed. Uh, they do a very, very detailed breakdown. Uh, one of my favorite parts here is if you get down here, uh, it is listed as not exploited and not publicly disclosed, so that's super cool. And then, of course, we have a breakdown of the attack, as I mentioned, that you can go to. And this was done by ZeroSum. And they discussed the double pulsar, as well as all of the shell code and a absolute total breakdown of exactly how this thing worked. And you can go through here and see, as they reverse engineer the code, you can see all of the calls. You can see how all of the code is managed. It is absolutely fascinating. But I wrote up just a quick little breakdown. So Microsoft had an exploit in SMB, which is file sharing protocol. That exploit has been available since 1.0 of SMB, okay? Since SMB 1.0. The individuals here actually wrote code that is able to discover whether or not your computer is x86 or x64. It then goes in and locates the MZ header in DOS. And then it starts allocating memory. And really what it's doing is it's sending malformed packets to the computer. Now they are good packets. The computer is able to interpret these packets, but they're malformed. And essentially what that's doing is it's creating a space on the computer where you can execute from memory. Then they find the SMB driver. And by sending these packets, they're able to allocate memory and then copy code into the system. Okay? And they create a backdoor. Now, there's a major flaw in the way this backdoor works. Because once you create this backdoor, anybody can use it. You opened up a huge hole in the computer that anybody can go through and you have no control over it. Now, for those of you who have any experience with malware or have any experience with actually executing attacks or any kind of penetration testing, if you create a door into a system, you want that to be your door. You don't want other people coming through that door. So that's the main flaw here, is once you create that door, everybody who is looking for this vulnerability automatically is able to send code directly to this computer. That's a big issue. For those of you who remember, Malware, sort of back in the you know, late 90s, early 2000s, what was the first thing most people installed on the computer that they infected with malware? Anybody know? No? Antivirus. 
True story. You break into a computer, and the first thing you do is you add antivirus, and you add all of the tools necessary to make that foothold yours and yours alone. That's the flaw right here. It's not your foothold. So once you've done all of this, the system then starts accepting knocks. Everybody familiar with port knocking? You set a port up, and then you can knock that port by sending like two requests to a single port, and then two requests to another port, and then when you're finally ready for that fourth port, your SSH is open because the system is actually sitting there looking for these um, requests. Very similar idea here. Uh, you can send increments of uh, 4,096 bytes to the system, and doing so, you're able to craft a shell code payload and then send it to the system and have the system actually not only decrypt that shell code, but then run it, which is a big deal. That's a very big deal. That is, a, that is an amazing thing to get a piece of software to do. Using what amounts to a buffer overflow in memory, you're able to get this thing to not only spit out errors, but to accept code and then deconstruct that code in that very limited space and then eventually execute it. This is very fancy stuff is the best way to put it. Um, I would like to warn everybody that it's going to get worse. Okay, At this level, now that we're starting to see this stuff, there are people who are already deconstructing this code and seeing how it can apply elsewhere. Okay? They're not just looking at this code and saying, well, Microsoft patched it. Like, uh, oh well. I guess we missed our chance. They're seeing how this code was crafted and how it functioned, and they're already starting to mutate it so it will work elsewhere. Um, and again, it's all being done on GitHub, and they're, they're sending information out. Uh, but in addition to that, don't remember, don't forget, I'm sorry, don't forget the attack that happened to the NSA with all of their information being leaked out, that's not done being leaked, okay? That's not finished. We're nowhere near done with that, so there's still more stuff on the way. Um, everybody knows that Microsoft released a fix for this thing months, or, months ago, correct? It was months and months ago when they released the fix to prevent this from happening, and it still infected thousands of computers, including very important high-profile systems all over the world. People aren't doing their updates. They're not going to do their updates. I'm going to tell you right now, it's not going to happen. Okay? So this stuff is going to continue to propagate. This is the start. This is the beginning. This is stuff that got released, and then people essentially got a couple of months to, to wait. And not only that, they actually released it to Microsoft and said, hey, go fix this. And Microsoft said, great, we will fix this. And then months later, people are still not prepared for this. I can't tell you what a mess that we're looking at. We're standing on the snowball, and it's just going downhill. So keep that in mind, especially with your systems. I know a lot of us in here are Linux users, and that's great. But the SMB protocol is available through Linux as well. And there are vulnerabilities in that protocol under Linux. So we're not, we're not immortal just because we put on the Linux code, okay? So now that we've got our initial scary thing out of the way, let's get into our performance objectives. So at the conclusion of the course, and for those of you who are not familiar with the way that these little talks work, I actually teach them like a general instructor would. So you're getting essentially the exact same education you would get if you were military or if you were police or anything else. If you were sitting in my classroom and we were all sitting around a table, this is the exact format that you would get. Get your performance objectives, we break everything down, and then at the end we actually discuss all of the performance objectives again. Yes? Did you get it? Yeah. Did anybody else get it? We got one other person? Well, you asked first, so go ahead. That's it. You're not going to drink it? Okay, well, you won. Enjoy your Mountain Dew right there. So we have a winner, and we have passed out our Mountain Dew. So <laughs> yeah, 
essentially all I did was I created two images so that you can diff the two images and see that even though they look exactly the same, there is excess content, uh, what makes up steganography in a second image. And then from there, you could actually even vim the image. And we'll go over all of this here shortly. But you could see that excess data, and it was just base, encode, base 64 encoded string at the bottom. You decode the string, and then it would just give you instructions. But we'll talk about the act of steganography, how you can hide data inside of other data. All of that is part of this. But thank you very much. So we're going to identify what PGP is. We're going to identify the use of a PGP public key. We're going to identify the use of a PGP private key. We're going to understand a little bit better what encryption is. We're going to understand when to sign communication. And we're going to understand what threats prey on trust issues. So we're going to be going over a lot of information. And this isn't all of it, but it is a part of it. So normally, we talk about privacy in here, right? Privacy is a big deal. We all want to be very private with our lives. Stay out of my information. You know, we don't want people reading our text messages. We don't want people going through any of our uh, phone calls. We don't want people rummaging through our mail. We don't want any of that stuff, right? We want our own autonomy. However, that is not always the greatest concern. Sometimes we need to actually be able to prove who we are. We can't just hide. We need to also be able to demonstrate that I am who I claim to be. Um, has anybody here ever received, and I know this is probably very rare, but have you ever received a phone call from a gentleman or young lady claiming to be from Microsoft letting you know that your computer is infected? Ah, so they said they're from Windows. Some of them said they're from Microsoft. So that must be them, right? For sure. It's got to be. They got your phone number, right? Seems legit. Why, would, why wouldn't Bill Gates go to somebody and say, hey, call them and let them know we need to make them safe? He's a great guy. He would do that. But... The reality is, those individuals can't prove who they are. And just because of the skill level that's found inside of this room, most of us can sit here and say, yeah, no. And go ahead, I encourage you to let them know, yeah, actually, I use Linux, and they get irate. No, you don't. You sure don't. I know you don't. You've got a Windows computer in that house. Love it. Fantastic. There's lots of stuff on YouTube about it. <laughs> so right now, the media, they don't like encryption. They don't like privacy. They don't like personal freedom. Everybody's talking about how it's too dangerous for us to have privacy. Think about all the people that are being private right now that are doing wrong. We should be held responsible for those people, right? No. I disagree. I'm going to tell you right now, personal opinion, no. However, there are a lot of people who want to stop you from being able to have privacy. But what I really want you all to be able to focus on is that not only do we have to have privacy, but we also need a way of being able to demonstrate exactly who we are and what we actually do. I should be able to go to somebody and prove who I am. You should be able to prove to me who I am or who you are. But actually, in all honesty, using these tools, you could actually say, hey, I'm going to prove exactly who you are simply because of the tool set that you have. And we're going to discuss that. So cyber terrorism its looming. It's a huge threat. Everybody knows about cyber terrorism, it's sort of the buzzword of the day. Everybody's worried about the cyber. It's the scary thing. What's going to happen when we have digital Pearl Harbor? Anybody seen that in your books, your textbooks, anything like that? Everybody heard? the term Digital Pearl Harbor. That's the term that gets thrown around whenever you're up at that level where people say, let's call the geeks. That's the term that they use, is Digital Pearl Harbor. Okay, Keep that in mind because you're going to see it in the future, especially if you're working in this industry. If you get into the security 
industry, this is how they push things. You have to be able to tell people there's something to be afraid of, and if they don't know to be afraid of it, you gotta make sure that they know to be afraid of it, and then once they know to be afraid of it, you gotta give them something that they can look at and say, well, it's gonna be just like this, okay? But let's start off with those privacy threats. Let's move towards that right now. The first one, who do we always need to save? The children. Children are being targeted not only by advertisers, but a whole bunch of other people. There are children's toys, and of course, if you brought your machine, I have a link taking you straight to the archive.is. Talking toys, accused of recording and sharing kids' secrets. Okay? It's all there for you to take a look at if you're interested, but there are children's toys right now that are designed and developed specifically to gather intelligence related data on the individual who has access to the toy. Not only that, the companies involved, and I just want to say this PDF is used without permission for educational purposes only, okay? But if we go here and I pull up this PDF, Nuance is the company that handles data recognition and voice recognition for the military. So all the information that's coming over through SIGINT, okay, signals intelligence, they gather up all your voices, all your conversations, everything. It goes through this company's database and they take it and they mine it so that they can learn about who you are, what you do, what you like, how your voice sounds, and to make their database better. Okay, so keep in mind, we have a children's toy that is designed specifically for kids to play with and talk to, and it says stuff like, hey, you know what would be really cool? If we went to Epcot Center, do you like Disney? What's your mom's name? What's your dad's name? What's your date of birth? What's your dad's date of birth? There is tons of questions that are asked by this toy, and then that data is gathered up and sent to the nuance identifier, okay? and it's delivering solutions for a safer world. And what they do is they gather all that information up and they mine it. And they take names and they take date of birth and they take words that are spoken and they take all of that and they look through it so they can kind of figure out when they're listening to other targets what words are being said automated through an automated method. Now keep in mind, who wants to sit around and listen to conversation after conversation after conversation, right? You can't, we physically can't do that. You can't pay a person enough money to spend every waking moment of their life just listening to people on the phone talk about nothing in the hopes that eventually you'll just pinpoint when they said something terrorism related and then you can jump on them. You have to have a way of piling through this information, whether it's voice data, whether it's uh, imagery, whether it's anything, we need that artificial intelligence, we need that toolkit that can go through all that data and find everything we don't care about and just get rid of it, right? Make sense? So this is what they are designing. This is what they're working on, this is what they're building, this is what they're feeding. They take that information and they give it to this machine so that it can learn what's being said. And of course, a man's voice is different than a female voice, which is different than a children's or child's voice. Okay, everybody's voice is different, so you need a whole lot of information so that you can hear different things happening in the background. Yes? Mm. As well as in law enforcement. So, for those of you who did not hear this, uh, Nuance is also the company that created Dragon Dictation, which is used in the medical industry for dictating. Uh, as well as in law enforcement for dictating as well. So they've got their hands in literally everything that has to do with voice. <laughs> Isn't that a question to ask? So not only are they harvesting the data, but they're also selling advertisement space within that data. So you all heard me mention Epcot Center. So Disney actually buys advertising 
through these tools so that the toy will talk to the child and then say stuff like, you know what's super cool? Disney's super cool. Hey, do you like Mickey Mouse? Yeah, you know you do. Stuff like that. So that the entire time that the child is interacting with the toy, not only are they gathering up information from the kid, but in addition to that, they're supplying information to the child about what they should think, how they should feel. All of that additional information goes along with it. And of course, I made sure that there's links to all of this stuff. So for those of you who are going through the web page, you can go through there and you can take a look at all of it to build your own opinion about what this potentially could be used for, OK? And again, all of this stuff used without permission, but for educational purposes only. So what's another problem with this? How much security do you think is on this stuff? Lots, right? For sure, they're locking these things down. They're sticking these toys inside of kids' houses, having them talk to the kids. Super security, right? We're talking 10,000-bit encryption. No, none, nothing. Open Bluetooth. I can literally sit outside your house with my laptop, and if you have that toy in your home, I can hit that toy, and it becomes a microphone, two-way microphone, actually. And I can talk to the child, or I can listen to everything that the child says. I can do it all from my laptop. No security at all. Not poor security, because there is a difference between poor security and no security. This is actual, legitimate, no security, none. You just connect to the toy, OK? Has anybody heard about the fact that a gentleman uh, is actually, I believe he's still in the court case, but don't quote me on this. It may have already been settled. But he actually broke into one of these toys databases and pulled all of the imagery of the children because the toy was designed where you take a picture of the kid and then you can add that to their profile and it makes like a little web page for them and all this stuff. So he broke into that database and pulled all of their voice data. He pulled all of their photos. He pulled all of the information about the kids. And then he went to the company and said, hey, all of this is available and open to the internet. So what did they do? Obviously, they secured the database and then thanked that gentleman with a reward, right? No, they didn't. If you guessed that they sued him, had him arrested, seized the database back, even though it was already open and out to the internet and a whole bunch of other people have already downloaded it, and then claim that he's the whole sole reason why that security was like that. He broke in and he downloaded that file and it's obviously his fault. When he did the download, it just opened everything up. He opened Pandora's gate, all his fault. That's what happened to that guy. So for those of you who are my students, or who have been my students, because I see some past students in here as well, everybody knows that I always talk about the No Saturday Night Special. If you remember back in the 90s, the big thing was Saturday Night Special. That was the firearm of choice for gangsters, for everybody. Everybody had a Saturday Night Special. It was so dangerous. What was a Saturday Night Special? I don't know. Nobody knew, but it was super scary, right? This whole thing right here is the Saturday night special of computers. That right there. What did he do? He downloaded the files. Oh, downloads. What else? Did he torrent? Was there Tor involved? How about encryption? What about the, where's the EFF? What are they doing on this? Same thing. You have a bunch of people who have no idea anything about technology, but they're sitting in positions where they make decisions about that technology. OK? Keep that in mind when you're pen testing. And I bring this up because a lot of us are. We're penetration testers. We work on stuff. Sometimes our companies or the people we work for even say, hey, find out how to secure this better. But keep in mind that it is not unheard of for companies to find out that something is so grossly insecure it is unsolvable and potentially a detriment to the company, aka solvency. That company will no longer exist if people found out what they were doing. And then, the people who actually found this stuff get in trouble, OK? And you can find incident after incident after incident of this online. You can just go look through the news. Start Googling for pen testing. However, I would like to redact the word Googling and reinsert the word DuckDuckGo. So what about adults? So we've been talking about kids this whole time. What about us? We're all adults, right, most of us? Adults are being targeted, too. We know this. We know this for a fact. We're targeted with advertisements. We're targeted with information data mining. If you have a car 
and that car has any kind of like GPS or anything else, they monitor all of that. Uh, Nissan GTR. That's a cool car, right? Pretty neat. Some of us are like, oh yeah, Nissan GTR, I'd take one of those. Except for the fact that that actually has a map inside of the vehicle that maps every single place you've ever taken the car in the history of the car. And they will actually go through that data and verify that at no time you were at a drag strip or at a racetrack when you go in for your car service. Unless you have a service contract with them that says that you can go to pre-approved racetracks. In Japan, the car is actually limited where you cannot reach past, I think it's like 85 miles per hour in that vehicle, unless it is actually located at a specific set of racetracks. So the car actually has to hit a GPS and say, oh, this is where I'm at, before it will intelligently allow the vehicle to reach certain speeds, okay? That is, to me, kind of offensive, but that's a personal opinion. I don't like that. If it's my car and I paid for it, I want to be able to have whatever it is that I paid for. But it's one more thing that they're doing. Everybody hear about Weeping Angel, another NSA goodie? Weeping Angel being the tool that is used in our televisions. So if you have a specific model of television. Uh, so for those of you who don't know or are a little bit younger, back in the day, a very popular conspiracy theory was that our televisions were watching us. That was like the conspiracy theory du jour. You know, you would buy a television and I guarantee you the, the government, everybody and their mom is looking at you through your TV. And back then people were like, oh, that's crazy. That's insane. And that was sort of the conspiracy theory of the day even all the way back into like the 60s and 70s. Like this is not a, a, a new conspiracy theory. However, all of those folks are finally really truly vindicated because it's true. If you have the tool set, you can look through the TV. In addition to that, for those of you who are not aware, even certain electronics that would not normally be built for those purposes with the right tool set can still be used for signal intelligence. Okay, Keep that in mind as well. So um, everybody remember those super cool Razer phones? It was a flip phone and it was super thin and you could take the battery out of it. Uh, they were popular not just with normies, but they were also popular with the mafia. You know, you're a mafioso, you're a super cool guy, you got lots of money, got all your jewelry and stuff, and then what, what's the final accoutrement for all of that? Your razor. And so they would take the battery out of the back of the razor and they would all put their phone in the middle of the table, and then they would sit down and they would have their business meetings. Except what they didn't know was that the razor is actually built where you could send a signal to it and it becomes a listening device with a whole bunch of razor phones in the middle of the table, that's how they busted a whole bunch of mafiosos. So think of how far back the razor phone goes. It's pretty old, right? Some of you are probably sitting in here thinking to yourself, what the hell is a razor? <laughs> but that is a, that was a tool that was being used back then. Think of what we got now. So we've got Weeping Angel, we've got all these other NSA tools, and we've got all the goodies that are on the way. Like I said, they haven't even been released yet. Today's sort of a depressing day, I'm sorry. Well, I, like, there's a, I'm serious, there's a picture of a dog later on, so we will feel better eventually, okay? But as it is right now, we gotta get through all the sad. <laughs> you can turn pretty much anything electronic into a covert listening device. You just can, okay? There's tools for everything, and everything is essentially Linux now. For those of you who are sort of on the fence about becoming a security researcher, I'm going to tell you all a personal story. And this, I hope, doesn't scare you all away. But you should know about this story. Everybody knows about Twitch, right? Twitch TV? So my idea is to create a t Twitch channel where I sit there and I play video games and then talk about cybersecurity related stuff. So you have fun. But then you also have like cybersecurity stuff that's serious that you gotta like look at at the same time. So what do I do? I go down and I buy an Aver Media game capture card. And I get up at three o'clock in the morning because I'm a busy dude and I'm like, all right, three o'clock in the morning, I can make some videos and stuff like that and this will be cool. The game capture card has an application for your phone. And the phone, you log in and then you pair that phone 
to the device and then you have control over the device from your phone so that you can sort of control it while you're still playing the game on the screen. It makes sense. It's a smart idea. So, however, when I try to install the application on my phone, it pops up and it says, hey, this application is not going to start, it's not going to keep working. Eventually it's going to be phased out and you're not going to be able to use it anymore. And I thought, well, I just bought this thing. That sucks. And I thought, well, I guess I'm going to send it back. And I thought, well, if I send it back, though, what does that say about me as a computer programmer? So what do, what do you think I'm doing at 4 o'clock in the morning? I got Wireshark open on the phone, and I'm PCAPing <laughs> this application, and I'm looking for documentation online for the API, and I'm like, I'm going to make this work. And then I find that there is an actual request that goes to the box that says, hey, I'm I'm connecting to the box, let's go ahead and do a registry. And I thought, well, that's important, it's a curl request. And because I already mass scanned the box to see what ports were open and everything's filtered. And so I'm like, all right, but I found the port that's being used for the API. It's like 2174, something like that. I'm like, this is cool, I'm, I'm on the track, I'm doing. All right, we're reverse engineering right here. And so I send the request and it says, hey, here's your little number, this is the registration. And I thought, okay, that's an important number, I'm gonna have to use that for every single request, right? That's your API request number. Obviously, we're going to need that. So then I send the curl request to turn the box on without the number, and it goes boop, comes right back up. I thought, that's weird. So then I sent the one to turn it off. Boop, it's off. No code, no nothing, no registration. And then I realized that the whole box is just open. And it's 7 o'clock in the morning, and I'm sitting there with a cup of coffee, still in my underwear, P capping an Avermedia game capture card instead of playing the video game that I wanted to play while furiously trying to essentially deconstruct this API. And then that's when you realize what you do is cybersecurity and not a whole lot else. So that's, <laughs> that's where you are. So. If you're interested in this kind of stuff, it's fun, but it will take you down a rabbit hole. You will get involved in stuff like you wouldn't believe. But let's get into operational security, the real operational security. Now, I do want to make a warning as we go further down here. You will see there are two link links. Those links are for the Republic of 4chan. Potentially offensive material, OK? So just keep it in mind, potentially. Has anybody ever heard loose lips sink ships? A few of you? Okay, loose lips sink ships have been around for a long time. I'm going to break it down for you for those of you who don't know what this means. It means if you run your mouth, people could die. It's that easy. You talk, people die. And this, if you have ever been in the military, if you have ever been in law enforcement, if you have ever been in medical, if you have ever been in essentially anything where other people's lives depend on you, you will hear these words spoken, okay? I'll make it even easier. Stop telling people everything about yourself. That's it, that easy, okay? However, we can use this to our advantage. I talk about measure, countermeasure all the time. If you're a student in my class, you have heard me constantly bring up measure, countermeasure. Goes back and forth, okay? Over and over here for the camera. What do people have for their job search? They use what? Linked? LinkedIn? People use LinkedIn, right? Companies use LinkedIn. People love LinkedIn. There's a whole bunch of tech companies that if you don't have a LinkedIn, essentially you're not getting an interview. However, I got a message from somebody who asked me, hey, I go to your cybersecurity meetups. What do I do to get a job? How do I do this? And I wrote back and I said, if you're going to these meetings, you're a hacker. You've got to be. You wouldn't come to these meetings if you weren't interested in being a hacker learning how things work, learning how to deconstruct stuff. So let's start with that. Loose lips sink ships, but it could also potentially get you a job. 
First thing you need to do is you get on your Indeed and you find all the people who are looking to hire, right? And you start picking out those people, but you don't apply yet. You just need to get the list of jobs. And then you head on over to LinkedIn and you take those lists of jobs and you start finding out who works there. And you start finding out what certifications they have because the question was posed, what certification should I get to get a job? I don't know. Guess what? Nobody in this room knows. I can tell you that right now. Spoiler alerts. Nobody can tell you exactly what certifications to go out and get. It's impossible because no matter what job it is that you're going to go out and try to get, somebody wants something specific. They just do. Everybody has a different opinion. I know people who, if they see you have a certified, certified ethical hacker certification, they will laugh you out of the building. They don't like that certification, but they like other ones. And then there are people who look at a CEH and they go, oh man, this is kick-ass cert. And they love it. But you need to know what they think about that certification, right? Every single one of you. So if you're looking for a job, what do you do? You go to their LinkedIn and you find out what certifications do they have, what are they proud of, what are they adding to their documentation to show people what their biggest accomplishments are. Find their loose lips. Find all the stuff that they're discussing, and then you build yourself a game plan. And you use that game plan to decide, okay, I want to work at these companies, and they all share these certifications as things that their team members have. What do you think that they're going to be looking for when they all sit down? You think they're going to be looking for other certifications, or, are you going to think, or, or do you think they're going to look for something more homogenous? Everybody kind of agrees on what's like a cool thing and what's not, right? It's kind of like that everywhere. And so the next thing you know, you have a list of exactly what you need to do for your career based off of exactly who it is that you want to communicate with and exactly how you want to work. But it's just analysis, okay? It's all intelligence analysis. It's OSINT. You all, are you all familiar with the term OSINT? Open source intelligence. People put information out on the internet, you're allowed to use it. Sort of. Yes, but be careful. Because just because they put it out on the internet doesn't mean that they meant to do it. But even our military currently has had to change loose lips, sink ships, to tweets, sink fleets. Think OPSEC. Operational security, right here. Your tweet could potentially end people's lives. And here in a minute, we're actually going to see where that's happened. I'm going to show you some actual events in which tweeting actually did that. Okay? So it's not just like me talking and just saying stuff. Like we're actually going to see real life examples of every single one of these events. Contact your FSO if you suspect a security breach. Do you know? that if you're a soldier right now and you have Facebook, you will have members of ISIS as well as other terrorist related groups attempting to see your Facebook, make friends with you, uh, create contacts with relatives and or, excuse me, friends, and so on and so forth. Tip of the day, it happens, okay? And this is a real and true thing. They are using open source intelligence. And it is easy. And it is simple. And it is not difficult at all. And it's not magic. This is the most basic of the basics. How do you find out about people? You ask them. Or you listen. Right? So let's go back. If you like that poster and you'd like more, I've also included a link to the CDSE, which is the Center for Development of Security Excellence. That's the US government, and they make like posters and information, and they make all the bulletins and so on and so forth. And you can actually come on here, and there's tons of them. You know, the attachment. This one's kind of cool. I like this one. Look, she's super scared of that attachment. Don't open it. I like that one. But there's tons and tons of stuff here that they're building specifically to try to explain to soldiers, sailors, airmen, so on and so forth, that what you're doing on the computer matters. 
and you need to be careful. And guess what? It's all free information that we can all use too, okay? And it's good information. But what about the incidents, you say? What about all these happenings? Well, let's start with Israel. Here's our first one. Israelis forced to cancel raid after an individual got on Facebook and posted some selfies and said, hey, I'm about to go out on a raid in this area. Can't wait. It's going to be super cool. Don't do that. <laughs> Life pro tip. If you are about to go out on a secret raid, tweeting about it. Don't do it. So this is not the only one. I want to make that clear. This is just a small collection of them, but it got to the point where I was like, I'm just going to do the top five because I was already at 25. And I was like, mm, we don't need to do 25. That kind of wastes our time. But top five. Okay, so this is the Israeli one. I like this one because they literally come out and say, don't go on to social media and post your secrets. Just don't do it. Great. United States. And I do two United States ones. US military forced to investigate Facebook group spreading naked pictures of service women. I'm going to tell you right now, this was dumb. Super dumb. You do not do this. You just don't. OK? This is, if, for those of you who came to my last class, the, the last discussion that we have where I taught about the people in the Philippines who were going out there and taking imagery and uh, taking data from people and getting their naked pictures and stuff like that and then using it to attack them. Same level. I have absolutely zero tolerance for this. None. Zero tolerance. You don't do this. Uh, but these individuals decided what they would do would make a secret Facebook group. There is no such thing. There is no such thing as a secret Facebook group. And they traded information and personal data about fellow soldiers. That is wrong on so many levels and could have gotten so many people severely, severely damaged. Imagine for a moment that you're passing out information secretly about an individual who is then preyed upon by people who blackmail that person and tell them, I've got these naked pictures of you because I broke into your computer, even though that's not true. But I've got these nude photos of you, and I'm going to send them out to the whole world if you don't give me information about the raids that you're going on. I want information about the people that you're about to go hit. Tell me about it, or else that data goes out. Shame, money, Love, those are all very, very powerful motivators. It's how you get people. Get. Okay? All of them are tools for making people do things for you. That right here is a serious breach. This isn't just like, ha, 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 naked pictures. I told some of my students about this, and one of them was like, well, what I'll do is I'll just take all my junk pictures and put them in with my resume, and then nobody can get me because you've already got them. Come on, dude. Not everybody's going to think that way. But let's go to the next one. US military social media accounts hacked by Islamic State sympathizers. Happens all the time, constantly. It is not difficult to get access to social media accounts. It's not, it's not difficult to get into your Twitter. It's not difficult to get into any of this stuff. They do it all the time. So anything that you're putting in there, again, secret Facebook groups where we trade information and intelligence on other people, not hard to access. Proof right here. US Central Command, CENTCOM, now members of the Cyber Caliphate. OK? And I'm sure we've all seen this. We've all seen it on the news. We've all seen it literally everywhere. Sorry. Uh, happens all the time. It's a constant and continuous thing. So what you are putting information-wise out onto the internet, just consider it open and accessible to the world. And then here in a second, we're going to talk about SS7. 
I said SS7, and before anybody Googles it, does anybody know what I'm talking about when I discuss SS7? Telecommunications, Telecommunications thank you. Yeah. Well, not just, but actually within the US, the SS7 is the actual underlying telecommunications system for every single cell phone provider, okay? So it's what links all of the cell phones together. It's like the cloud sort of above all the cell phones. So we'll get into that here in a little bit. But if they want your data, they have it, okay? Now I'm gonna bring up this, it's bad words, we're all adults in here, okay? There's no like violence, no gore, no nothing like that. This is the first one. This is the night that 4chan coordinated an airstrike, okay? And again, all of these images are available here, and if you don't know who Ivan is, Ivan Sidorenko, he's actually fighting out there in Syria, I believe. Um, some individuals, members of a Islamic terrorist group, decided to make videos. And they made videos of themselves doing attacks, uh, training, it was a, a pretty detailed creation of all of the things that they were doing, including violence, including uh, you know, beheadings, so on and so forth. They created a very, very detailed video about, uh, sort of like a fan video, about how great they were. So what did these people do? They sat down and they looked at every single image frame by frame and they figured out where these videos were shot. And so then, after figuring out where the videos were shot, they then mapped them. And they created detailed maps of where every single one of these events were, all the way down to, hey, here's an image of the two minarets, and then here's where the minarets are located, and then here is where the, the image was actually shot right there. That's where the person was standing in order to get both of those images there mathematically. Okay, broke the whole thing down. And then, after they did all of this, and they started figuring out the entire event, and they had the whole thing mapped out with detailed coordinates, they then reached out to Ivan, and they asked him, hey, bro, if we give you all this data, can you get it to the Russians so that they can bring in some airstrikes on these locations? And the guy said, yeah, sure, send it over to me. And so they did. And they sat down, and a whole bunch of anime guys sitting around at their laptops and computers, built a detailed strike chart, called it in over Twitter, and executed an airstrike, okay? Correct, they do call it that, actually, yes. They refer to it as weaponized autism, if you have not heard the term, uh, and they, are quite proud of that term. Later on, Ivan then gave a shout out to the group and let them know, hey, good job. Very thankful for their actions. And a whole bunch of them actually celebrated about it. So now let's hit the button again. And we're gonna open the next one. And guess what, they did it again. It wasn't just once, okay? Once is a fluke. Twice is the real deal. This time, training videos, loose lips, right? Create a video, have all this stuff inside that video. You don't even think about the fact that right here, that image right there, it's power, power lines. Okay, and that's the tools used to keep those power lines up. So what did they do right here? They went and actually pulled up power lines so that they can make sure that those were the real power lines. Okay, and then they went through and they mapped it all out. Hey, here's the power lines, here's everything, and here's all the data so that it's all broken down. We can see building one, building two, building three. Go out here, one, two, three. Everything's all broken down, all through maps. Oops. Oh, I'm on the wrong one. Sorry. And again, so on and so forth. Every single thing they went through frame by frame. Frame by frame and were able to map out with coordinates exactly where these people were training. 
And at the very end, what do they do? They call up Ivan. Hey, Ivan, here's coordinates. Can you blow these people up for us again? And the second time through, it didn't take nearly as long for this guy to go, yes, I will do it. It was a much shorter amount of time from them going, hey, we have things, before he went out and actually executed the attack. And then they recorded the attack, and there it is. Right in that area, right where they called it out. They said, hey, these are the bad guys. We don't like them, we're unhappy with them. And what do they do? They execute the attack, and then, of course, if you go through there, you can see all of the celebrations. How many of you, oh, sorry. How many of you think about what your information could be used for? Potentially. You make a, a few of you, I do, I know I do. I sit there and I, man, there is a reason why sometimes my girlfriend is like, just take the picture. Just get in the picture and just take the picture. And I'm like, yeah, but I don't want anything in the background where they know where we're at. All right. Like, as if this this same methodology was used to mask Antifa terrorists and uh, capture Shia LaBeouf's people not about his flag right. too, right? Yeah, they call it capture the flag. So, uh, what he just brought up was was this technology the same essentially technology that was used for Shia LaBeouf or whatever his name is and his um, uh, like putting up his resistance banner and all that, and then they constantly went in and captured the flag. And it got to the point where they were actually using star constellations to figure out, because of the movement of the stars on the video camera, they were able to figure out exactly where the flagpole was, and then send people out to go capture his flag. Okay. So if you're wondering what kind of data can be used, literally all of it. All of it. Okay. Just blanket statement, they can use all of it. In addition to that, what they did was, for the Antifa folks who were operating in Berkeley, uh, they took every single image, frame by frame, of every single picture, and they created a breakdown of all of the photographs of people's faces. So when people were getting prepped to go out and do stuff, they had a pre-face, and then when they would see them doing something illegal, they had an after-face, and then they would put those together. And then there was a gentleman by the name of Clanton, and Clanton struck a man in the head with a bike lock. He put it on his hand and then hit the guy on the back of the head. And even though his face was covered uh, using previous imagery, they were able to take and superimpose his image from other frames over the current frame to demonstrate that it was the same guy and then provide that to law enforcement who then eventually executed an arrest. He was a professor at that school, yes. He was a professor at the school who struck a man in the head with a bike lock. So I have a problem with that, and I'll just I'll make a personal statement here, I guess. Uh, my father was in a motorcycle accident when I was a kid, and he lost a lot of his capabilities as a person for a long time because of a head injury. So I don't take, like, hitting somebody in the head lightly. That is a big no-no around me. I won't put up with that. So uh, because of the things that my family went through. But... People can take information, every bit of information that goes on, whether it's an image, a video, anything, you can take that data frame by frame and you can use that in order to find quite a bit of information, right? So we've talked about SSL before, but we're going to talk about it again. And the reason why is because we're going to, I am going to say, when you are communicating with web pages, how should you do so? With SSL, through SSL, correct? If you're going to communicate with a web page, you want that web page to have SSL. SSL is going to provide encryption for your connection, and it's going to protect things like usernames, passwords, and other digital information that's being transferred between your computer and the internet. Neat. Basic stuff, right? We all know this. However, SSL does not provide proof of data assurance and cannot prove that the data is truthful. It is only good for providing a layer of encryption over the data. There is a difference between true data and encrypted data. Let's make that very, very clear. 
just because something is encrypted does not necessarily mean that it is true. It does not. I can encrypt anything. I'm from Microsoft. Encrypt it. Send it on over. I need access to your computer. Anybody can encrypt anything. Encryption is not proof. I got a link in here. Fake SSL certificates that are actually trusted by the people who deployed those certificates are in the wild. Google super bent. Bent enough that they banned some of these um, uh, individuals who were deploying certificates like Simon Tech. Simon Tech? Symantec. All right. I don't use them, so I don't need another name. They issued 30,000 certificates improperly. Is it? I also don't use Norton for sure. <laughs> for sure on that one. So 30,000 certificates improperly handled. OK? They just, pff, here you go, Google.com. You want Google.com's SSL certificate? Here it is. We trust it. You hook that up to a domain, put that into a, a web browser, it'll come back green. It'll show that little k lock. And it'll say, hey, issued by Symantec. The mishandling of these SSL certificates led to Google restricting the use of those certificates on the Chrome browser. It actually comes up and says, this certificate sucks. Not exactly like that, but pretty close. And it tells you, you cannot use this. And it shows the little broken lock. Because every single time Google went to this company and told them, stop issuing certificates improperly, they said, OK. And then they immediately went out and continued issuing certificates. The same thing can happen with GPG, because Bit9, who is now carbon black um, malware protecting resource routine, right? They were pwned and all their keys were stolen and malware authors were signing malware with those same exact keys. Yes, but that's that's yes, but that's a different event. But, but yes, and we will talk about keys. Uh, the, it wasn't really a question, it was a statement, but there was a discussion here about the fact that certain people have had their keys stolen and then those keys were used to sign, digitally sign uh, like malware. And that is true, that has occurred. However, we'll get to that. So let's talk about download assurance. And actually, that's kind of nice that you brought that up because we're going to talk about Linux Mint and how Linux Mint would compromise. Now, oh, come on. Hold on. I do want to state very clearly. Okay. Wait, what are you? What are you laughing about the Linux Mint thing? Yeah. Okay. So I want to state that this link that I have for you all to read is FUD. It is very funny. It's all about like, if you use Linux, it's just a toy, and it's not a real operating system, and it's not ready for prime time, and there's a whole bunch of stuff like that inside of here that's total garbage. Okay, Linux is 100% ready for prime time. If anybody's ready for prime time, it's Linux. Okay, Linux is a good operating system. I like Linux. If you are able to take over a web page, guess what? You're not going to break the SSL. If I have access to your WordPress web page, like with a shell, if I get a, a shell into your WordPress web page, I can start pushing data to your WordPress web page, and it's not going to affect that big green check mark in the corner. It just won't. It's not going to make any changes there. So what we need is separation of failure. If we have a failure one place, we still need to be covered in other places. Just like with everything else, literally everything else. This is all a very fancy way of saying we need a backup plan. In the event that something terrible occurs, how are we going to resolve the issue that was created? Okay. Um, an individual gained access to the Linux Mint forums. Upon gaining access to the Linux Mint forums, they were then able to pivot to the web page. After pivoting to the web page, this guy was like, well, I can actually upload files to the web page. 
So I'm going to take this copy of Linux Mint and I'm going to bring it down off the web page and I'm going to replace it with one that's filled with malware. And so he put that up there. And then being a smart guy, he said that he actually did the GPG signature key for his copy and replaced the key on the web page with a key that said, yeah, this is real and true. So the place that you would go to to get the key to, prov to provide proof that the binary was real and true was the same place that you went to go get the binary. So all he had to do was compromise one web page and then he was able to disassemble the entire page and put it all back together using nothing but bad data. Okay? All he had to do was get his foot in one door. And once he was in that single door, he had access to everything, which is exactly what he did. He also claims that nobody ever even checked the GPG key. So it didn't even matter. He was kind of mad that he did all of that extra work to sign the, the, the binary, and nobody even checked it. They didn't look. So he uploaded an ISO. He signed the ISO. He uploaded the signature. And then he was able to distribute his infected software. And guess what? It distributed for like a week and a half, two weeks. It was just on the page, and nobody realized that it was a bad copy. And anybody who was using it was propagating malware. They had a, at the operating system level, vulnerability. But Linux Mint is now a pillar, an absolute pillar in terms of examples of how to do your ISO security right. They didn't just get punched in the face and then fall down and then be like, ah, I'm done. Whatever. If you guys still want to use Linux Mint, whatever, I don't care. They didn't do that. They actually looked at their entire process and they fixed it. And that's fantastic. Um, I'm going to break down how to verify a file. But you can actually see that all of their, their keys are hosted on Ubuntu. So you have to go to the Ubuntu web page in order to get the keys. Uh, there's a whole bunch of like extra legwork that you have to go through in order to really do everything correctly. But guess what? That's the right way because it's no longer a single point of failure. Somebody would have to infect Linux Mint stuff, and then they have to infect Ubuntu stuff, and then they have to go to a key signature site and infect that site as well. It's a lot of moving parts that you have to defeat all at once without getting caught before you can put everything back together. This is much more robust. Okay? Anybody here work with SHA-256? Some of you? A couple of you? Yep. So if you haven't, SHA-256-SUM is a uh, command that you can run. And that command will allow you to check the SHA-SUM of a file. If you were to go to Linux Mint, you can get their SHA-256-SUM text file. Then you can download the signature for the SHA file. Uh, you can get the SHA with this command. And it looks a lot better on the web page because I, I actually have it like edited to show the code. But since we're not on that view, you can't really see it that well. But you can actually get the SHA using that command right there, switch B, on the ISO. So you can then start doing verifications. Every single one of these numbers is going to match. Okay? And that's how you know that it's real and true. Then you can use GPG to head out to the key server, and you can receive the key specifically signed for that ISO. And guess where it's coming from? Ubuntu, just like I stated earlier. And then once you've received that key, then you can fingerprint to make sure that the key is real and true. And then finally, you can verify everything using GPG, using the sum.txt. Uh, .gpg and all of the other items that you've sort of accumulated here, then at the end of it all, from all of these disparate sources, it all comes together and you can verify, yes, this ISO is real. And it's actually a lot easier than I make it sound. You just follow the instructions. If you're, if you're able to install Linux, guess what? You can do this. Every single one of you can. There's not a single person in the room who can't do this. Here are a list of key servers. Hey, I told you all there was a dog picture. See, I didn't lie to you. Some of the key servers that exist include PGP key server, MIT key server, the SKS key server, a whole ton of them. Lots and lots of key servers all over. Pick your poison, pick them all, 
You can upload to multiple places, it doesn't matter. When you're doing your keys, which we're gonna talk about here in a minute, everybody developing their keys, and then we, of course, I also have a discussion here about a uh, PGP encryption as a service, which is a company that's gonna be providing PGP encryption as a service. Uh, and I have invitations to it. So let me interrupt right here. If you have not heard of Keybase.io, Keybase.io is currently invitation only. I have 20 invitations, okay? Hit me up at the end of this, I will log in, or you can give me your email address, and then I will send out invitations to anybody who is interested in getting a Keybase.io account. It's PGP as a service, you can go in there, you can set up an account, and then once you set up an account, you can actually sign whatever it is that you're working on. Uh, and let me actually demonstrate how I use that. So if you go down here to my page, this is my key base for my Retro 64 stuff, because this is sort of my brand. My whole idea is the Retro 64 stuff. And you can go in there, and if you have a Twitter account, which I do, which just points you to my Mastodon account. So you can go to my Twitter, and then it says, hey, I'm actually using Mastodon, don't use Twitter. All of this is signed. So my GitHub, I go in there and I created a thing that says, yes, this is a Retro 64 XYZ GitHub. Yes, this is my Y Combinator. Yes, this is my web page. Yes, this is my Bitcoin address. Yes, this is my Z coin address. This is each one of these addresses that are important to me and I actually show that they are real and truthful and it gives you a level of authentication. Now they're still new and potentially this thing could be a huge NSA honeypot and we wouldn't even know. Okay, who knows? You just, nobody knows if you're a dog on the internet. That's just where we're at. But it's a really, really novel idea and it's a really nice idea, and it's all built directly into a web page that works with applications. You can actually see I have four devices registered. So you would know what device I'm using and how I'm communicating with you, so you can verify is that me, yes or no, truthful or not. Now there are ways to do this with the command line, and we'll discuss that as well. Like we can just do it in the command line. Everything that's being done here, this isn't magic. This isn't additional stuff that somebody thought up. This is just giving you an easy to use method to access this information uh, sort of through a web page or through your phone. So, and again, I've got 20 of those things. So if anybody wants one, just hit me up at the end of the show and then I'll grab emails or whatever and I'll send out invitations. It's invitation only right now. So what does it mean to prove who you are? Well, on the internet, no one knows your dog. Nobody knows who you are. If you're using the internet properly, essentially you're an anonymous person in a pool of anonymous people, right? And at the end of the day, even if you're using Facebook, really, I wouldn't even know if that's you or not. Because I could take a picture of anybody inside this room, snap a couple of pictures, follow you around, and then go make a Facebook and put a name and a photo and a whole bunch of data to that and I could become that person. And if you don't think that that's happening, that happens every single day. People make fake Facebooks for people constantly. It is a constant thing. And of course, Facebook hates that because it poisons their data set, and so they will look for those things to get rid of them, and they also look for like all the role play people. People make like role play, I'm a Toho character, and here's my little anime picture, and here's my Facebook, and I'm Momiji. Like, but they hate that because it screws up their facial recognition. It screws up their accounts for being able to monitor who people are. All of that stuff is poisonous data, so they constantly trim it. Theoretically, unless you give information out, we shouldn't be able to collect that information. If you're not on the internet, right? I should be able to get data about you. Well, that's not necessarily the case. I'm gonna make a very, very small um, guess about some changes that are gonna come. If you're not aware, there's a lot of public records out there on the internet, tons of public records. I can get online right now with your name and essentially find out every member of your family, if you've ever bought a car, bought a house, if you've ever started a business, if you've literally done anything with the government the government, due to the Open Data Initiative, takes all of your information and pushes it up to the internet, and there are people who are sucking on the end of that fire hose and putting all your data out on the internet. 
I have tracked people all over the world with open source intelligence that comes from open records. All right, I'm just gonna tell you right now, if you've done a thing, you are probably on some sort of list on some web page somewhere where it's you, your family, your kids, and then they've got a list on there that says, we also think that you're involved with these people. No, those data sets are sometimes so sophisticated that even if you change your name, you can still send it back to who the original is. Right, because for you to change your name, you're going to have to do it through, guess what? The government. And so the minute you put information into the government, the Open Data Initiative means your data is going to go out back straight into that company that you were trying to escape from. Some states have protection from this, but only if you are a victim of stalking or domestic violence. However, that also means you have to go track down every single web page that has your data on it and tell them, this is me, here's proof that it's me, so now you know your data is good, and here's all of this very personal stuff about an incident in my life where I have to tell people about terrible things that happened to me over and over and over again just to try to get them to pull that information off of being online. My thoughts, and this is personal, again, this is going back to a personal opinion, but I think that we are going to see changes in the way that these laws are applied within probably the next three to five years. Because people are already starting to use this data to harass people who are in government. So there are mayors and there are people who are in uh, state representation and things like that. And people are starting to pull down their data and then go fly drones around their house and flash lights in the windows of their homes and stuff. And when terrible things happen to the normies, the kind of, you know, that doesn't always hit hard. But the minute that people who work high up in government start going outside of their house and seeing drones with big signs, and uh, they're also working on pulling down all of the um, pornographic data in terms of like what porn web pages that certain people go watch. And once they have all that data, they're gonna start releasing that specifically for like state representatives and people who work in government just to kind of demonstrate like if you want to put our information out on the internet great we're going to do the exact same thing to you so this is going to push a lot of these groups to make very drastic changes in the way that this data is handled I would be surprised if within five years they have not made changes to the law that either protect all of us or protect a certain subsect of people okay certain subsect being like once you hit a certain level of government they're gonna like cut you off from having to worry about this. But there will be changes to the way this is handled. I encourage all of you to pay attention to that in the news and do, you know, follow who supports protections against this kind of stuff. So, however you wanna take that. But, coming full circle to Keybase. Let's talk about Keybase first. Keybase is super neat. It's cryptography for everyone and not just for hardcore programmers. That's their little spiel. If you want to use Keybase, it's a great way to be able to digitally sign stuff, digitally encrypt stuff. Anybody who's using Keybase, you can chat with them using PGP encryption in order to transfer information. Uh, again, I have no idea. I have no connection to these people. I don't know who they are or what they're doing. And the potential that at any time somebody from uh, the FISA court could step in and be like, do the thing. And they go, well, I don't want to do the thing. And they say, well, here's the FISA court order. You do the thing. That Potentially, that could happen, OK? Especially because it looks like a lot of their developers are here in the US. And guess what? That means we are, as US developers, potentially somebody can come in and be like, you do the thing or else. And you are beholden to that, OK? And if you don't know what I'm talking about, FISA. Google, DuckDuckGo. Sorry, I gotta retrain myself. So they have a neat little tool and I like it because it's sort of the future. I like the whole idea behind Keybase. I like everybody having the ability to digitally sign stuff and digitally encrypt things. Your digital signature should be part of who you are. To be honest with you, I like it more than like a social security number because I don't 
like the fact that literally everywhere I go, they need my social. However, if I could just digitally sign things, I would like that more. There's also people who are looking at this in terms of blockchain. If you need to be able to prove who you are, or prove proof of life, Julian Assange, any of that stuff, they're, they're using the blockchain for that. I don't know if I entirely agree with that. There's some parts of that that I look at and I, again, like with Julian Assange, when he signed the blockchain to say, well, I'm still alive. I mean, I don't know about you all, but I can type a J. I can type a whole bunch of different letters into my keyboard. So if you don't have a way for people to digitally sign, which this is the part of the thing with PGP, you would have like a signing party. Okay, so let me break this down. We would all come in and we would trade keys and we would all like verify who we are. And there's different rules. Sometimes you have to bring a government ID. Sometimes you gotta bring somebody to vouch for you. It just depends on the, the method that's chosen. And then you show up with your little government ID or your homies, whoever it is, and you all come together and then you sign together to say, okay, yes, I know this guy right here and I trust him and I believe he is who he says he is and he's not under duress. And so I'm signing this to say that at this point in time, this key is good and he is good and I trust him. And then a whole bunch of other people do the exact same thing. And then we go round robin doing the exact same thing and so, of course, it helps to have big names. Um, the more people who sign your key, the better. And then in addition to that, the more people know other people. The whole idea is a web of trust. You're going to hear that. For those of you who are going to take this information and go out and start doing some studying on this topic, it's the web of trust. But we don't have to use a service. We can use GPG. Okay? So I show how to generate a revocation certificate. First thing you should do is make a certificate that if you have your key, once you have your ID of your key, you can create a certificate that says, if this certificate goes out, that means that null and void on my, my actual certificate, I'm revoking it. Why? For safety and security. If something happens, you revoke the key so nobody else can use it. Here's some instructions on how to actually send that key to a server. So you can take the full key ID and you can send it up to like SKS key servers. And then if you want to back up your keys, here's how to do it. So I have a little breakdown for those of you who are interested in GPG and you want to start learning how to do it. Here's how to create the keys. Here's how to back them up. Here's how to create revocation certificates. Here's all the stuff that you need to get started. It's GPG party in a, in a box, okay? The whole thing is all broken down. Now let's start getting into threats because we're getting close to the end. There are a lot of threats. A lot. And I could sit up here and I could just make everybody depressed because I could talk about all the terrible things that are going on in the world and how everything sucks and the whole thing's on fire. And it's bad. Okay? We can talk about that all day. But I'm going to talk about some of the more effective ones that are in the arsenal of the threat actor. These are the, these are the ones that make you money. First one, whale fishing. This is a specific form of fishing and what I'm going to do is I'm going to read to you the little whale fishing email that I created and then we'll break it all down and actually figure out exactly what whale fishing is. Retro 64 XYZ. The business is at risk because we forgot to pay our bill to Nigerian Superconductors, LLC. I know we usually pay them bi-weekly, but the bank forgot to clear one of our checks and now we owe a double payment. Can you please send a payment of $1,800,000 to Nigerian Superbank, account number 12345, routing number 54321, please don't hack. If we don't pay it, they will stop making the chips we need and the whole business will go bust. Hurry. Also, don't call me because I am obviously on vacation in Idaho where I go all the time because that is where my mom lives and you know that because it is information you could find on my Facebook. Please pay quick. We covered all of our bases, right? If I was a thief, this is an awesome email. It's even spelt right, okay? What we want is a call to action 
with a feeling of urgency. What's the feeling of urgency? The whole business is screwed up and you're the only person that can save it. You, on your shoulders, right now. You're the most important person in the world right now or else we're all eating dirt for the rest of our lives. So we, we have urgency, right? Then we have a call of action. What's the call to action? Send money. Got to send that money right now. Could be passwords. Could be accounts. It could be pictures. Uh, it could be contact information. I'm trying to do intelligence analysis on a person. I'm trying to find out more on this person. I'm digging deeper. So you send a whale fishing email like this to somebody and you say, I got to get so-and-so's address right now. If you don't send me their address so I can get over there and work with them, the whole world's on fire. Everything's burning to the ground. And the next thing you know, thinking, well, it's not money. Well, who could use this information? Why is this even important? You type up an email and say, oh, hey, yeah, yeah, no, you're right. I, I didn't realize that you were a, a law enforcement officer that needed this information about this person because their child is sick. Here is their address, and here's their phone number, and here's all the information that you need. So you can go sit out in front of a, a, a house behind a bush waiting for that person to come out so you can hit them. That is the way that people gather data. Urgency, call to action. But the information is important. That power line sitting in the background means the difference between eating dinner and getting a rocket. We've already seen that. Real life examples, right? Now I do admit, hey, this is a silly example, but it's going to cover all of the bases that you see in a real whaling email. What did I do? I did a little research. I implied the research in there. What did I do? I went to Facebook and I found out that such and such person goes to Idaho all the time because they need to take care of their sick mom. And they post all the time things like, pray for my mom. And they show pictures of the, the, you know, the angels praying and stuff like that. So I know that they constantly have to do traveling and they have to go places. All of this is information that you can use to build whatever it is story-wise that you're going to have to use. So we, we being those of us who work in security, what do we have to do? We have to be able to teach people, don't get hit by that. Just because somebody says something doesn't mean it's true. Just because it's encrypted doesn't mean that it's true. There's no authority there. We have to be able to prove authority. Okay? And then I let them know, hey, in a silly way, don't verify any of this information because I'm gone. But in reality, how would you do it? You would tell them, my cell phone's dead. Or in I Idaho, I don't have access to my cell phone. Why? Well, don't even call it because I don't have a tower. It's Idaho, right? Why would Idaho have cell phones? I've never been to Idaho. I wouldn't know the difference. But it's all about building a story that's believable enough to get people to take action in the way that we want to manipulate them to do. And guess what? It could be believable. If I know that you're constantly complaining about a bank that you do business with, and then I go in there and I say, hmm, I know. The bank held the check. They screwed up with the check again. It's the third time they did it. And you go, oh, man, yeah, that's, that's good information. Where did that come from? OSINT, open source intelligence. I go in and I look at your Facebook, and I look at your sharply worded Yelp review about the bank that you do business and how they never, ever, ever put in the checks on time correctly. You might not even go check because you're so used to it. So the next one's going to be fraud. And this one is this one is probably one that we're all going to see at some point. And it's called the invoice scam. And you'll either see it on your credit card, okay, where somebody charges something to your credit card, but it's low enough that they hope that you won't notice. Anywhere from $25 for a Steam account or for an Xbox little gift card. Or for a business, it could be quite a bit more. Uh, most people are going to try to keep it under $250, but they'll send you an invoice. And they'll say, uh, you ordered mouse pads. You bought $25,000 worth of computers for all your employees. 
I'm going to follow in on that and I'm going to send you a bill for $250 to $5,000 depending on the size of your company, so on and so forth. But I'm going to send you a reasonable bill and it'll say mouse pads. And who's going to sit there and go, oh man, did we really, did we buy a bunch of accessories for all these computers? I mean, you know, 5000 bucks after I just blew $50,000. I mean, is that, is that so strange? No, I'll just pay it. And I, every single company I have ever worked at has received a B2B message, whether it be a letter or an invoice or so on and so forth, that says you owe us money. And they're not real. Okay? And guess what they do? They go out to the city and they find a list, using what? Open data of every single business and then they take that list from every single business and they create invoices and they shotgun those invoices. Boom, 250 bucks per business. How many businesses do you think are in Phoenix, Chandler, Mesa? Probably more than 10, right? So you take your shotgun list of invoices and send that out to every single one of these businesses requesting $250. And now think, of, think for a minute, if you receive $250 from 10% of all of the businesses in the Phoenix area, Think you'd be doing all right? Yeah, right? You'd only have to do that maybe like once a year. And you do that once a year and you get 10% from every 10% of the victims throughout the entire Phoenix metro area and you hit them for 250 bucks a piece. You're making you're making a little bit of money. But we're cybersecurity experts, right? We're geniuses. We're not going to fall for that. Guess who just fell for that for 100 million dollars? Google, some guy sat down at his computer and he went to LinkedIn and he went to a bunch of other web pages and he pulled up all the Google people and then he pulled up the, I don't know how many people here work with like the stock market, but you can actually look up filings from companies, okay? So you can sit down and you can pull up the filings for a company and you can actually see all of their business dealings. Because when you are a publicly traded company, there is certain information that you must make public. So if I'm a publicly traded company and I buy $50 million worth of servers, guess what? That's a pretty big number. And that means that that affects the people who own stock in that company because it's an expenditure. And so this guy went and looked and pulled up all the SEC filings and figured out what companies they were doing business with on the reg. And once they had that list and he was able to create that list of companies that they're working with, he then created invoices, created email accounts, and did all of the homework that he needed and then started invoicing Google. And he would send them invoices to the tune of $100 million. And they paid it over and over and over because he was smart enough to sit there and figure out how much money they're spending, what would be a reasonable amount, and what it would require for him to contact somebody and say, hey, you need to pay this. And he did it to Facebook, and he did it to Google, and he did it to all the people that we, as security professionals, look at and go, they're probably pretty smart people there. And even they fell for it. Because who's going to sit there and think about that, right? Who's going to think that somebody's going to take all the time to do research about a company, find out who works there, find out what their interests are, develop documentation about it, and then follow through on communicating with those people. Whoa, that's weird. We just broke down exactly what we were talking about with trying to get a job. Except you're trying to get a job versus you're trying to swindle a company out of money. However, if you're curious, that gentleman's doing a long time in jail and he's in a lot of trouble. And they recovered a whole bunch of that money. So if you were just curious about what happened to that guy, it didn't go over well for him. So what about GPG encrypting with our key? Well, I just link to the Debian GPG guide and it's very, very, very good. I have a link in there to Debian's GPG guide. It breaks a whole bunch of stuff down, how to sign things, how to encrypt things, how to do all of this stuff with creating your keys, all of that. It's a very, very good read. It's all free, 100% recommend it. If you have an interest in this stuff, sit down, take a look at it for a little bit. It's really, really light reading, but it's good. It's nice, it's very educational. So let's go over some of our answers. P 
PGP is an internet standard for encrypting and digitally signing communication. Neat. A public key is used to encrypt data. It is safe to give this key away. Safe to give this key away, very important. If you have a public key, you can give that to somebody that can't pretend to be you. A private key is used to decrypt data. It is not safe to give this key away. Do not give away your private keys. Not, never, no, 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 no. Never give away the private key, okay? However, think about keybase.io. What are you doing? You're storing your private key with them. What does that mean? They have total control over the account. Just keep it all in mind, okay? As you're deciding on what your threat level is and what you're trying to accomplish, there's that sliding bar, right? I'm willing to risk this much in order to get this much out of it. It's always going to be a trade-off. And for anybody who works in computing, we all know what that trade-off is. Usability versus security. How easy is it to use a system versus how secure that system is. How much effort do you need to put in initially in order to be able to use it. You can use Keybase.io and it's super easy to use. But potentially, other people could do stuff with that account that we may not like. Encryption is the process of encoding data to prevent unauthorized access. Signing digital communications anytime you need to impart trust in the origin of the data. If you all have known who I am, you've met me, we've signed and swapped keys, and I sign data, and then I give those messages out, you can assume that the information there is truthful and from me. Okay? Because anybody can make an email. I can actually get into a server right now and make it look like an email came from anybody here as long as I have your email. And I can say all kinds of terrible things to your boss and your friends and your cat, all of those people. And I can send them all an email and it would look like it came from you. And it would take them doing some sort of forensic work to go back through it before they finally figure out Oh yeah, no, that, that wasn't actually from this person. Uh, if anybody here wants to ever contribute to the Linux kernel, you must have a PGP key, and you must sign all communications, and you also sign your code. Okay? They get to know you before you get to put stuff into the kernel. Surprise, surprise. So this information that I'm giving you, it's being used places. This is old. It's like 1980s level technology, and guess what? It's still good. Still good, still there, still in use all over the planet. It just takes the education of teaching people that it's available and it's something that they can use. So privacy, anonymity, authorship's assurance, they're all important aspects and deserve equal focus by both the security community as well as the public. Okay. It is imperative that the next generation of security researchers be able to not just move in secrecy, but provide proof of self. We cannot become so engrossed in the secret squirrel stuff that we forget the practical and the useful. It's more than just hiding or sending encrypted messages. Sometimes it's as much about being able to prove who you are. In addition to that, sometimes people are proving who you are without you knowing. Anybody know the name Reality Winner? Yeah, a couple of you. The young lady? Yes. So there was a young lady who worked at the NSA. Yep. And she decided she was going to leak documents. She was going to be the next big leaker. And they immediately caught her. Why? Because she started printing the documents there at the NSA, packed them up, and then sent them out. And guess what? That printer marks every document. Her computer marks every document. Literally everything. I'm going to tell you all a little secret. Okay, and this is a pretty important secret that you should all keep in mind. I, as a sysadmin, if I'm on your network and I have control over your network, I know what you're doing. I know everything that you're doing. You will not do something on my network that I will not know what you're doing. Because even if you're using Tor, we've talked about this previously, all right, I will know you're on Tor. And that's what I need to know because that's outside of your wheelhouse. Unless you use Tor constantly and continuously and every day and all the time, then I'm going to know that you're doing something weird. And then you immediately become a suspect. Okay, Just like with the kid who tried to call in the bomb threat at his college. He didn't want to take his finals. And so what does he do? He calls on the bomb threat using Tor. And what do they do? 
They immediately go to him and say, did you call in the bomb threat? And he goes, yeah, I did. Why? Because they were able to pinpoint it directly to him. Why? Because he was the only person on tour at the exact time when the bomb threat happened. And as soon as the bomb threat happened, he was off tour. That's weird. It's about the additional information that you can use to figure out what's going on. It's not about hiding everything. It's not about being a secret person who steals documents and sticks it all in a thing and then sends it out and then nobody's ever going to find out because guess what? If you are working on a computer, they know. If you're using a printer, they know. If you're using a television, they know. Uh, back when uh, Apple was making odor about not de decrypting the terrorist funds, sure. I was ferrying a group of Boy Scouts somewhere and uh, they're all busy playing with their cell phones and, uh, and that we were discussing that and uh, I told them, hey, anything on your cell phone, you cannot assume that it is private. Right. And for the next five minutes, they're all going to delete, delete, delete. <laughs> yes. Always counts. Any kind of electronic device that you have potentially is compromised. Just keep it in mind. It's just the, it's the thing to think about, OK? Uh, we did the challenge. Congratulations again on your awesome Mountain Dew. Let me know how that is. Final recommendations, and then we're going to open up for questions, and then we'll be out of here in just a little bit, OK? Register a PGP key. Use Keybase if you're uncomfortable managing it yourself. Keybase is pretty neat. Don't trust it with your life, OK? If your life depends on your PGP key, do not use Keybase for the, the tool. Not at this time, probably not ever, OK? If it's the difference between you staying alive and you dying, that's not the tool to use. However, it is a neat tool for communications between you and your friends, you and your dog, whatever. It's, it's something that you can use to build up towards, hey, every communication that I do is encrypted. Me, I use Signal. Is the Signal app secure? Probably not. Who knows? But guess what? For every single person that I communicate with, I communicate with them through Signal. If you send me a text message, I'm going to send you a message back that says, hey, get on Signal, and then we'll talk. That's just what I do. Why? Because I have built a history of using Signal. And in the future, in the event that it is ever called into question, were you using Signal? Yes, I use Signal. Is that weird? No, it's not. Why? Because I always use Signal. Same with Tor. Are you using Tor? Yes. Why? Because I use Tor. When were you using Tor? All the time. It's not, I just get on Tor to do bad stuff. I jump on tour, and I'm, the only time I'm on tour is when I'm doing bad stuff. And then when I'm done doing bad stuff, I'm off tour. Guess what? The only time you were on tour was when you were doing bad stuff. The only time bad stuff was happening is when you were on tour. Guess what? That's correlation. That's one for one correlation. And now we have something to work with. That's the big power pole in the background. What did I just say? Encourage the use of cryptography and digital signing in business. Add the word private life to there as well. Learn to sign your communications. When you send an email, make sure that it's signed. You're not just doing it to be fancy. You're doing it to build a historical record of that behavior and of what you do. And then I have a glossary in here. What's PGP? What's GNU PG? What's GPG for Win? Because there are some people who use Windows. Don't. And then, of course, there's key server, and that's all broken down down there. So we have a little bit of time. Open for questions. Anybody have any questions? Anything that I can answer or anything that I need to cover? Yes. Uh, when, we're, when you're talking about jobs, wouldn't a Red Hat certification be pretty something nice that people would consider? Sure. Uh, Red Hat is used in a ton of businesses. The vast majority of companies that are using Linux are using Red Hat. There's a lot of people who use Red Hat, and if they're not using Red Hat, they're using CentOS. So having some sort of like proof of concept, yes, I know how to use Linux, particularly Red Hat, particularly the fact that Mesa Community College is now Red Hat certified and can give you a Red Hat certification if you are interested in going for continuing education. If you're looking for Red Hat stuff, yes, there are places you can go, and yes, Red Hat is a good certification. However, there are more than just those certifications. There's a ton of different ones. 
Are you going to find somebody using Manjaro Linux at a business? Probably not. I mean, it's just the likelihood, pretty low. Are you going to find somebody using Ubuntu Server? Probably much higher than Manjaro. Are you going to find a business using Red Hat or CentOS? Probably even higher. Yes. Um, so, yes, some way of proving your Linux capabilities is very important for your resume. But in addition to that, like I said, it's breaking it down based on where do you want to work, what information do you need to have to put on that resume, and what's the most cost effective. If you look at that list and you see everybody has three certifications, potentially, if you can't afford it, looking at that list and finding the most expensive certification to get first may not behoove you. You may want to break it down from least expensive certification, next least, and then finally the most expensive if you still have to go there. But if you can get your foot in the door, a lot of companies do pay for continuing education, so keep that in mind. Sometimes it helps to get the, whatever the minimum is, to get the foot in the door, and then once you're in, get them to pay for the rest of your education, okay? Yes? Could you explain why, in general, Linux operating system is safer compared with, uh, let's say, uh, Windows? Ooh, you want to start an argument. <laughs> That's going to start a huge fight. So the question was presented, why is Linux, in general, considered safer than Windows? So there are many reasons that people cite. I'm going to cite the reasons that people provide, and then I'm going to try to hope that nobody jumps up here to like fight me in the middle of the PD. So number one, there is an idea, and I agree with this idea on a personal level, that open source software is more secure than closed source software, regardless of the fact whether or not people are checking that software based entirely on the purpose of if there is a problem, people will fix it quicker and have more concern and care about those problems in a closed, in an open source operating system than in a closed source. Windows being closed source, aka you and I and anybody in this room legally do not have access to the Windows operating system source code, whereas all of us here have access to all of the source code that's available for Linux. Okay? So now, the counter argument to this is just because it's available doesn't mean people are looking at it. It's, and that's just the fact of life. How many people can raise their hand and say that they have gone line by line through every piece of code in the Linux kernel? It, well, theoretically, even he has not. He looks at a lot of the stuff, but he, he does delegate some of it. So. When you started, sure. If we go all the way back to, to Linux kernel 1.0, yep, we could, he could probably say, yes, I've looked at every single line of code on this. Now, not so much. Okay? So just because it is available doesn't mean everybody's using it, but it's, it's the potential for being there. Number two, the security, um, the underlying security style in Linux is essentially the Soviet style, which is nothing's permitted except for what we say is. That's why you pseudo up for everything. Whereas the underlying security system for Windows has traditionally been the American style of everything's permitted, just do whatever you want unless we say that you can't. But that means that in general, it's much easier to ri run malicious code under Windows than it is under Linux because somebody actually has to pseudo up and run that code. And in general, people who use Linux are traditionally more advanced computer users, more likely to be afraid of threats, and more likely to be considerate of what it is that they're running, as opposed to somebody who has a Windows computer who's sitting there and they just really want to get into the Club Penguin. Like, if that's their goal at that moment is to hit that Club Penguin, they're just going to double click and they're going to ABC always be clicking. Whereas with a Linux user, it's much less likely that they're going to sit there and look at something and go, oh yeah, this came from this company. Uh, and it definitely says clubpenguin.malware.exe.sh, I'm going to run that. You just have a different, you, you have a different style, you have a different uh, type of person who runs Linux versus Windows. And I know that gets into like the whole, whoa, I'm a Mac, I'm a Windows, I'm a this, I'm a that. And, but in general, you will see the people who run Windows are different than the people who run Linux. And so that is another major part. And then in addition to that, there are less people who are creating viruses and creating malware 
for Linux than they are for Windows simply because of market share. If I can get 55 million children to double click on that exe file and I infect 25% of them and now I have access to their parents banking account information under Windows, that's much more lucrative to me than infecting maybe 10 or 15 Linux administrators. So the, the marketplace is different for Windows and Linux and the infections. So there is a whole bunch of reasons and a whole bunch of them are well cited and there's a lot of arguments about it. But in general, it's just one type of person and the way that they use a computer versus another type of person and the way they use a computer. Yes. So RHEL 7 and CentOS 7, I think it's new with 7, during the installation pro process in Anaconda, you can select security profiles. Mm -hmm. So you can actually set up, for example, a server that's going to be PCI compliant from the very start. Yeah. And that's all part of like the SE Linux and how well, it really doesn't have anything to do with SE Linux. It will set up the the initial file system in such a way that it's going to be compliant with that standard. Huh, that's interesting. There's about a half dozen selections you can make during the process. Uh, for example, Red Hat corporate certified server. So, I've only had a topic for one of these evenings, right? Sure. I've only had to deal with PCI compliance a few times when it was when I was working for another company the, before I went into what I'm doing right now. And I find it interesting that when I picked up the phone and called the folks at the government and was like, hey, I need like a full breakdown of what PCI compliance means for my company and what I'm trying to accomplish, they essentially said, I don't know, but if you screw up, we're going to come in and we're going to use this to punish your company, not necessarily for you to like defend the data in a specific way. We just want to know that you did stuff, and then if you did, then that's good enough for us. So I would love to see what their standards are under Red Hat. Yes. Um, when you talked about retaliation from government officials, I guess based upon the harassment uh, cases when people were flying drones, could that, number one, how do they, you know, will not find and prosecute these people? But number two, um, as far as, do they do the same retaliation, say if you post something on Facebook, say like for instance, I disagree with John McCain's policy on this, are there people that maybe Hypothetically speaking, John McCain would hire to investigate, you know, people that are giving him bad press on, say, Facebook or on social media and things like that. I don't have exact examples for you, and I can't say any names, but if you were to Google Facebook or and or social media re retaliation, uh, yes, DuckDuckGo, if you use DuckDuckGo and you go look up some keywords like social media related retaliation, there are examples online that you can use. And you will find examples online of certain individuals getting in trouble for actions taken against people on social media. And right now, Donald Trump, uh, our current president, is being sued by a young lady who is very angry at him for blocking her on Twitter. So there are there are things going on in terms of that. But you're saying that essentially like, um, there are groups like that will sort of retaliate if you say for maybe some things that are controversial that you might publish or. So all I'm gonna tell you is there are examples of situations that would be indicative of retaliation for posts online. And those, you can find those online, but I don't have any names and I don't have people for you right now. No, I'm not asking for names, but you're just saying that there, it is possible if, say, for instance, you share certain opinions or whatever, that there are groups that might want to share negative opinions of, or negative things about you or things like sure. that. Definitely look it up. You will find tons of examples. Yes. I guess the best example you could give him is the leaker, I suppose, NSA leaker, right? Many people don't think she's a leaker because before she leaked those NSA documents, she actually tweeted out her opinion about our current president. And so many think she did what she did in spite of our president, not because she viewed the, uh, her actions as an actual leaking event.
That I don't have a, a comment on. Yes. Also, uh, there's a company called uh, Cambridge Analytica, which is a multi billion dollar company that has been used to weaponize social media to serve both political and corporate gains. So the threat is much bigger than individuals and groups at 4chan who want to act against you, but it is uh, it, it's capitalist at this point. Well, Russia has a cyber team. Israel has one of the biggest cyber teams in the world and one of the most professional. And uh, three quarters of the Israeli cyber counterterrorism slash social media team is um, dedicated entirely to spreading pro-Semitic information online. So they do what amounts to a very, very, uh, very, very laser-like focus on making sure that people have a good opinion about Israel. And they will regularly post in threads and spend a lot of time on web pages like 4chan working that. And that's also well known because of the fact that if you, so I'll get with you in just a second. If you are a person who is under the age of a certain specific age group in Israel, you have to do mandatory military service. If you go to specific schools in Israel, then you sort of get funneled into very specific places that you can go for training. And if you show an aptitude in computer hacking or in working with certain things, then you get funneled to very specific teams. And those very specific teams are well known for then funneling those people back out into companies and into businesses where they're hired very, very quickly because of their skill set. And that's all sort of well known in the the information technology slash information security like group. Like once you get picked up by one of those units, if that unit is cybersecurity focused, which Israel does have the world's largest cybersecurity focused like battle ready unit, if you get picked up by that group, you're almost guaranteed a job elsewhere the minute you're done with your mandatory service. Like that's well known. Their skill set is very, very high, and their, their missions that they do are very, very constant, and they get a lot of training and a lot of practice. And I'll leave it up to you to do your duck, duck, go to figure out who those groups are. So yes, you. A uh, question for you and for everyone in the room. Um, what can we, as knowledgeable people, do to get rid of this, it ain't broke, don't fix it attitude for patching and security updates. I'm glad. You have an opportunity with WannaCry to say, look, it can cost you billions. Yes. But what else can we do? I'd love to hear any ideas. So I'm going to, because it's my show, I'm going to interrupt first. <laughs> uh, Microsoft. Anybody here go to the Microsoft store over here at the, the Fashion Center? Did you know they have classes constantly? Cool classes, good classes that start all the way from little, little knee-high kids where you can come in and you can learn about Minecraft. Did you know Apple, they have classes on a daily basis. You can go in there every single day to the Apple store and you can learn something. I go to the Apple store constantly. Why? Because I'm taking classes. I take free classes on art, on music. I like to play video games, so I make little video games and I do all of this stuff and it's all 100% free. And I was sitting there and I was thinking to myself, like, I'm in enemy territory. I'm 100% undercover. I got my iPad. I'm in here learning how to make chip tunes with some dude who's like super pro Mac. And, every, and, I'm, and I'm just a Linux guy. And I thought to myself, where is the Linux store that I can send people to? And then after a few minutes, I realized, oh, shit, I'm the Linux dude. I have to go out and I have to teach people. And guess what? Every single person in this room, you're the Linux person. You have your circle of friends. You have your circle of contacts. You have all of the people that you can teach, that you can train. You can come here and you can do talks. We're constantly looking for people to contribute. You can ask, hey, can we do like a training thing? If you know Linux stuff or if you want to share that stuff, you need to be doing that. Because guess what? Windows is doing it. Mac is doing it. Everybody's doing it, but not enough of us in the Linux community are doing it. And if we're not doing that, if we're not contributing to Linux in some way, and guess what? You don't have to be a coder. No, not a single person in here has to write a line of C and go out there and contribute to the kernel. You can contribute in other ways. You can be the propaganda unit that says good things about Linux online. You can be all of those things, and that's what we have to do. We have to spread that information.
Yes. What we do in our computer club, a senior, is try to convince our members that they should, they're not going to keep their, like, their um, antivirus and their malware up to date. So get the hell off Windows. Sure. Yeah, updates. Exactly what you brought up. Nobody's going to do the updates. They're not going to stay up to date. So guess what? You're still going to have to do updates, but that's where we come in to help those people set up automated updates. You can get in there and you can create automated update profiles for your computer so that it just constantly stays up to date. Yes. I was wondering if there, there are, I heard, I think I used one time some Linux-based antivirus program. Is that advisable? There is a Linux-based antivirus, but it's more like wearing protection for your partner, not necessarily for you. Okay? It's ClamAv. You can use ClamAv and there's other tools where you can search for Windows related viruses that are coming in through your network. I have family members who use Windows. I have people in my family who have Windows computers. So guess what? Anything that's coming through my network is getting hit by a box to check to make sure that whatever it is that they're doing is safe. You can do the exact same thing. You can search for viruses. You can run things through ClamAv. You can run Squid Proxy. Everybody here has a special skill set that allows you to do things that other people would be considering magic. Like we can do all of that stuff and it starts in your own home. That's where it all begins. Do you have a question? Or are you just stretching? Oh, yeah, sure, I, I, well, I did, but I wasn't going to say it. Uh, in relation to WannaCry, we have to remember it was a re-weaponized weapon. Yep. So it was an NSA tool to keep leverage against now ourselves. And you have the same thing with the CIA's Bolt 7, right? So all the big guys who had cyber squads in the U.S., they've all lost their toys. And they're all going to come back and buy Shut everyone down. back in the butt. So and, and relate, now you can get into should the government harbor zero days or should they not? Well, they're allowed to hold zero days for at least two years before they have to report it. And if you trace back to when Microsoft actually released the patches, the NSA held out for the longest period of time before they realized we need to let Microsoft know so they can make a fix. So, I mean, whether it's broke, don't fix it, what do we do, et cetera, et cetera. I think there's more, it's more than just the people and our users, and more should our government be paying corporations like Microsoft or Apple or whoever they might be to actually put this in software. And not even that, they're actually starting to get it to, to open source and they're actually paying their analysts to review open source code for potential vulnerabilities. And then they put it all in their fusion center, they do the same type of stuff, and they develop a exploits. So, thank you. I would say that 99% of that is accurate, but there's one thing that you're missing, and then we're gonna shut it down, and the one thing that you're missing is that there are open source projects who have stated that they have had malicious code either inserted into their projects purposely or been paid to do so. So keep that in mind. It's not just review of code, it is the creation of code. But I also got told I talk too much. So it is time for us to shut it down. So thank you very much. What?